Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to you. My name is Richard Orm and I'm your host for today's webinar examining the accessible mobile reading revolution. Okay, let's get started. Our team at DAISY are in regular discussions with library services, college and university colleagues who tell us about user trends and expectations. Of course, mobile has been a factor for many years and many DAISY member organizations have launched apps and some students have been using their mobile phones and tablets for reading eBooks. But what we've been hearing is that the events of 2020 have accelerated the shift to mobile for many end users. That rate of change seems like it may continue through 2021. And when all of this is over, it will be interesting to see if changes in behaviors for reading and learning will ever return to how things used to be. Once again, we have a super panel for you today as we explore the accessible mobile reading revolution. How do things look from a college perspective? Are the needs and expectations of students with disabilities changing? And from the digital textbook platforms, what are the numbers telling us and how are they responding? And for people with reading disabilities, does the reading experience on a mobile device really measure up to a proper computer? Well, there's lots there for our speakers to get their teeth into. So let's turn it over to them and I'll ask our panel to introduce themselves. Thanks, Richard. Hi, uh, I'm Erin Lucas. I am the Senior Director of Digital Accessibility at Redshelf. Hi, I'm Darren Evans. I work for Wake Technical Community College in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the virtual learning community there. Hi, I'm Stacy Ray, and I'm the Product Manager for Bookshelf by Vital Source. Hello, everyone. I'm Robin Spinks. I'm the Senior Innovation Manager at Royal National Institute of Blind People, RNIB, in the UK. So a quick overview of today's webinar. We're gonna hear the view from a college, and this is from Darren, before really trying to get into, is learning really going mobile? And we're here from Erin and Stacy on that. Then we'll hear from Robin on accessibility on mobile. Does it measure up? And then as a group, we'll discuss the future of accessible mobile reading. So Darren, over to you. Hi, well, we did a survey at our, uh our individual learning center on, with students and just asking them how they access course material or learning management system. And it was a pretty extensive survey of about 12,000 students or so. So the numbers we came up with, they interact with content. 12% are on desktops, 46% uh, uh, were laptops and 42% are totally mobile. We have some students who prefer mobile. We have a blind student who just, his preference is voiceover on his iPhone. So it's, it's really happening and, and we're, we're noticing these numbers increase more and more. So what we need at colleges, we just need mobile responsive content that is accessible and usable for our students. And the more specific need for us is for mobile responsive, accessible textbooks and class materials that we can put out there and these students can interact with on their phones and tablets because the reality is that's what they're doing now. Well, Darren, that may be the reality, but can students really be proper students if they're using an iPhone or an Android tablet? Well, here's a poll that we've got for our uh, webinar attendees. We'd love to hear your views on this. So the statement is learners need a laptop to be a serious student. We'll of course learn a lot during the course of today's webinar, but we'd love to hear your thoughts as to whether or not learners need a laptop to be a serious student. Looking forward to your responses, but um, now let's move then to hear from the perspective of the ebook um, platforms. So moving over to learn about how learning is already mobile from Stacy. Thanks Richard. So one of the webinar objectives is to really answer this question, is learning going mobile? And, and Darren, you saw his, his pretty impressive numbers that he presented from his university. I'd make the case that you know learning is already mobile and what we're gonna see is a pretty strong increase over the next three to five years as it continues to grow. 
at Vital Source, we have a long history of providing mobile solutions using our bookshelf reading system. In fact, we have um, been providing uh, or delivering our iOS and Android apps natively and accessibly, I should add, for over nine years. And we have about 2 million users annually accessing content on our mobile apps. So it's, it's already here and it's been here for a while. There are many reasons that learners choose to use mobile apps over more traditional browser or desktop applications. Our users will typically cite portability, the need to work offline, and just the overall convenience that a mobile app provides. And as some of us, as Richard had mentioned, find it really hard to believe that phones and tablets can be an effective way to study today. But these students, they grew up with mobile apps and mobile phones and tablets in their hands, and they're really accustomed to spending a lot of time on their devices, whether that's reading or doing banking or just socializing. In the typical term, we see about 15%, somewhere between 15 and 20, I would say, of our page views are actually on a mobile application. That said, not all experiences translate equally to a smaller device screen. Some features like read aloud become very important as you know, users are trying to take advantage of that portability. Other features like maybe taking flashcards or notes Really, anything that requires that extensive amount of typing are often reserved for uh, computers and laptop. Anecdotally, we hear from our users that they might choose a platform, really depending upon whether they're at their desk or the type of content. So if they're studying STEM, they might you know, want to have a more focused experience, whereas you know, often they'll use uh, their uh, phones as a complement. And so we do have a segment that relies solely on phones and tablets, but I think it's, I think it's a, a little bit of a smaller audience. If we're thinking, you know, 15, probably anywhere from eight to 10 will we'll use, um, we'll use those, those phones and tablets as their sole learning experience. So can mobile, really app, mobile apps provide the same level of accessibility that learners expect from desktop applications? I think the answer is really yes. I mean, from what we've seen, it, it definitely can using and taking advantage of those accessibility features that are available through the operating system, but it does take commitment. But that commitment is no different than we see on mobile or on the browser's web platforms. On an engineering side, one of the things that has been very important for us to consider is really when we're doing our basic engineering, making sure that buttons are labeled, that headings are, are identified properly, um, focus, focus, making sure that the focus moves through the mobile platform in a way that makes sense to the user. And so if you have a user that's using an assistive screen technology, you know, the, the focus needs to move around the screen in a way that they can I, um, ideally digest where they're at in the application. On the content side, EPUBs really provide a better reading experience since the text reflows to adjust to the screen size. PDFs can be challenging on phones since most users really need to zoom the page and then they have to you know, pan side to side since often only a portion of the page will fit on the screen. So those are a couple of things to, to keep in mind as, as you consider whether mobile is appropriate for studying. One interesting stat that I have is that, you know, our mobile usage is you have been really impacted by this learning uh, COVID experience. So while our number of users have increased from 2019 to 2020 on our mobile apps, we saw a, a pretty big increase our actual page views dropped by 3%. And I know that seems a little bit counterintuitive, but as people has transi transitioned from a learn at home situation where they're on the move less, you know, they may be in lockdown, they really are, are not requiring that portability. They're using more that traditional laptop experience to do their studying. So in the next slide, we're gonna take a look at some of the top bookshelf features that our users use. Um, the top uh, five features 
um, over the last six months have been table of contents, highlights, search, read aloud, and display controls, which allow our users to make those visual adjustments, including changing the background color, fonts, size, line spacing, and margins. We consider TOC and search to really be navigational elements. Again, here's where if you have um, a user that requires you know, an assistive technology like a screen reader, you're gonna wanna make sure that as the user um, completes a search that they're actually, you know, that focus is moving around the screen in appropriate way. Read aloud and display controls are particularly important for learners with low vision or certain reading disabilities and some eye conditions. The interesting thing is, is that these are top five for our mobile applications. Pretty much the same top five, um, uh, top five ranking on our desktop and browser applications. Maybe a little bit of a different order, but the features that are being used on mobile are the same features that are being used on browser-based programs. So what's next for us? Um, dynamic text and dark mode. Those are two items that uh, I think, again, aid the assistive technology. So with or aid the assistive, assistive tech, uh, community with dynamic text, really relying on that operating system um, accessibility settings to increase the text size within the app automatically. So if you have it set for all of your apps, they'll automatically size the text. Dark mode, again, getting back to that, um, that point of you know, making it easier for, for individuals with low visions or certain reading disabilities and eye conditions to read the text on their screen. Okay, next slide. Internally within the bookshelf team, we talk a lot about meeting learners where they are. So bringing them into the center of creating our user experience. Building an accessible app is really a shared responsibility among design, product, and engineering. It's important to move that accessibility conversations to the left of the design, of the design or the build phase. It's not something that we can wait until we are actually building the app to address. We do that by starting with good design. So one that takes accessibility into account from the beginning. Our goal is not to simply take an interface that works on a desktop and squeeze it down onto a tiny screen because then you're just gonna end up with a real cluttered mess. Sometimes you have to make some uh, very conscious tactical decisions about whether a feature is implemented on a mobile app or whether it lives on, um, on the, the main inner user face or whether it has to live behind a specific menu. I'm gonna contradict myself here a little bit and say that consistency is also important. So if you think about a user that is using a screen reader on a desktop, they're going to have a certain, um, I think almost a memorization of, of what that, that interface, how that interface should navigate. It's important to remember that, that that understanding is going to apply to a mobile app as well. And so as much as possible, we wanna to try to keep that focus so that it moves in the kind of same direction. We also spend a lot of time purposefully designing and conducting user testing on our mobile devices just to make sure that we get it right. Whenever we build a feature or update the UI, we recruit and test with a audience of users that are primary mobile users. And it's all about making sure that the experience is, is intuitive for them and any changes that we have made to that screen design to accommodate for that lack of real estate, that it is again, intuitive and makes sense to them. We haven't gotten to the point yet where we're able to do user testing with bookshelf users that um, do utilize assistive technology like screen readers. Um, but we do test our, our prototypes in advance with our accessibility testing consultants to identify areas that may be difficult to make accessible. And we've actually made some changes to our designs based upon the feedback from our testing consultants. For example, 
you know, we had um, probably about six months ago, we had developed a design for a feature that included an accordion uh, drop down. We actually, our testing consultants came back to us and said, hey, listen, this is not going to be easy for a person on a screen reader to actually navigate. These are notoriously bad. They recommended that we create a, a, or utilize a tree structure. Visually, it, it got us where we wanted to be with the navigation, but it was much easier for that, that screen reader user to navigate. And so we made the change and I think it, it proved very valuable for our, our learners. So once we're ready to enter the development phase, um, building an accessible app is really no harder than building a web-based platform. The major difference here is that with web platforms, developers often will rely on public or internally developed component libraries that have been tested for accessibility kind of to create that base for their application. With native apps, our developers use the operating systems built in accessibility features, um, accessibility APIs, either available through Apple or through um, Android and other developer tools to build an app accessibly. A um, couple things, you know, I talked a little bit about, you know, focus being, being a, a challenge um, here, buttons and headings and making sure that if you're on iOS that you utilize the rotor. Those are things that are really important for, for screen reader users. We also like to consider mobile first success metrics. And so again, we talked a little bit about read aloud and how maybe that was more important for a uh, mobile user than potentially uh, a desktop user or browser user. You know, we develop success metrics based upon the platform. And so the success metrics for read aloud might vary a little bit on mobile than it does on desktop. And finally, um, you know, big word advice, advice, just keep current with the operating system. And, and this is for developers, designers, um, learners, staying up to date on that um, operating system really ensures that you're getting all of those great new features that come with each version release. And so there are a lot of accessibility settings that have been recently released in Apple, like increase um, co color contrast, differentiate without color and dynamic text sizing that can really aid the accessible, uh, the user that requires an accessible environment. And so that's it for vital source. Now let's hear from Erin. Um, she'll talk a little bit about Red Shelf's journey to mobile. Casey. Um, yeah, really, it really is a, a relatively new journey for us at Red Shelf. Uh, we have always been a primarily a browser based focused e reader, um, you know, just concentrating on the ability to have that available anywhere on any device, even if you're taking your content offline. Uh, but obviously, you know, we, we you know, started thinking that a mobile app would be a really great idea for us as well. Um, and we, we really started digging into that in late 2019, not having any idea, of course, at the time, how important it would be in 2020. Um, and really, that did help accelerate the roadmap in terms of uh, developing an app. Um, we had uh, four schools who were getting ready to move towards a a tablet providing uh, pr provision for their students um, in 2020, even, even before COVID was a thing. Um, and so we, we really wanted to focus on those users and those schools to uh, do our proof of concept. Um, so um, we were you know, really aiming to get it uh, to everyone as fast as we could. But again, um, you know, we well, we might have you know moved a little bit towards having a, a longer runway. Uh, COVID really just made us you know push for um, something that we could release in 2020. So we decided that we would uh, use the hybrid app approach, really, because that um, allowed us to leverage our existing accessibility um, and uh, UI um, to get to market a little bit faster but really it was initially intended to be just a proof of concept. So we didn't really market it outside of those four schools. 
uh, really just focusing on their users. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, <laughs> turns out we didn't have to market it, uh, speaking to those digital natives who managed to find it anyway. Next slide. So um, we, you know, we quickly realized that mobile was going to be here to stay. Um, and uh, thinking forward beyond that proof of concept and, and that pilot, uh, we knew that students were going to remain off campus in fall. Um, learning anywhere really became the norm for everyone. And then we also heard a lot from our DSOs how challenging it uh, is for a lot of students in terms of having access to Wi-Fi. So that just made mobile all the more, you know, an enticing proposition uh, for us. And then we really did prove out that students were expecting an app uh, as part of that pr proof of concept. And like I mentioned, you know, digital natives, if they want something, they're going to find it one way or the other. And um, even though nobody really knew that we had an app, they found it. And at the beginning of the fall term, it had been installed almost 12,000 times. And uh, we started, of course, getting uh, you know, feedback and reviews and questions and all of that on really what was meant to be just a proof of concept. So what we did is we kind of took a bit of a step back and decided, okay, let's you know, shift our focus right now on improving the app experience in the short term. Maybe not think about you know, where are we gonna go next with this? Are we gonna move away from the hybrid version of the app or are we gonna go to more like a native app um, like Stacy was mentioning? Um, so you know, we wanted to just you know, make sure that everyone was having the best experience they could with the app. And um, over the course of the fall term, as the spring term started, our installs almost tripled. Uh, our reviews went from like 1.2 to 4.2. So we, you know, we we felt like we were on the right track in terms of you know the direction that we were taking our idea for the app. Um, it is worth mentioning that uh, just over half of our app users are on iOS devices. Uh, I think a lot of that also has to do with the fact that it initially started at those tablet-based schools um, who who were using iPads basically. Next slide. Um, so, you know, obviously we, we have to take into consideration a lot of things when it comes to mobile and accessibility. Um, and obviously accessibility first is, is a huge part of everything that we do. You know, we view it as a requirement and not just a feature. Um, that's essentially across all of our products and most especially our e-reader. E um, and, you know, some of the lessons learned here are really that you can't assume that an accessible desktop experience is going to be equal uh, in a mobile experience. So there are definitely things that you, you have to take into consideration. Um, and you know, while obviously the, the basis of the rules, if you will, are the same, uh, but you really do have to dig into the testing and find people to give you, you know, feedback and make sure that uh, you, you aren't just taking the accessibility on your desktop for granted in mobile. So uh, we did find that hybrid apps can be a little bit more challenging than uh, native apps in terms of uh, accessibility. So, you know, all again, part of the things that we look at towards the future uh, in terms of, you know, how our app is going to evolve. Um, but we did find that iOS was a little less challenging in the accessibility arena than Android. Um, the Apple devices seem to be, you know, far more open to certain things um, and, um, you know, that's all the more reason maybe to move at some point towards more of a native app, because I think that will eliminate some of those challenges. Um, and, you know, really, we, we always talk about uh, born accessible EPUBs, we're, we're big advocates, obviously, of, of EPUB. But, um, you know, to both uh, Stacy and Darren's point, uh, content really needs to be accessible and responsive. Um, and, it, and it's, if we're going to continue down this path of mobile, which is obviously where we're, we're headed, uh, we really just need to keep reinforcing that shift to EPUB and you know, support publishers in that journey. So also in talking to quite a few of our DSOs over the last year or so, uh, they talk more and more about you know, students using their mobile devices for learning. And so what that really means is now they also have to support that as an option for their students and learn more about how all of the things in, in the student's operating system works and the assistive technologies built into their mobile devices. 
and you know, faculty also has to take that into consideration. The way that they're they're um, the, the, they're teaching, the way that they are choosing their materials, and um, you know, they already have to consider accessibility as part of their materials. But this is you know just another really another layer of that. Um, so if they're not already focusing on that on that already, they will definitely need to uh, do so in the future. So um, thanks for listening to uh, Red Shelf's journey, a relatively short journey for now, and hopefully we will um, have more to come in the future in terms of the Red Shelf app. Um, so up next is Robin, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about all of those accessibility features on the devices. Thank you, Erin. So students need a laptop to be a serious learner, just reminding people of the poll. Um, now, thinking about measuring up, are the accessibility features on mobile devices up to the mark in terms of uh, visual adjustments, read aloud and screen reader features? And for people who are relatively new to this, it's as simple with either platform, either Android or iOS, as configuring a toggle to turn on or off the screen reader. So every device has the capability. Three clicks on my voiceover device. And then I've just turned the screen reader on or off. I'm now picking up my Android device. I'm going to hold in the volume up and volume down buttons. And the same thing will happen. Talk back on. Top back will come on. Vibrate. Pixel launcher. Talk back off. And now top back has turned off. So super simple implementation at the operating system level. And I would encourage everyone on the call and the webinar afterwards to take a look at the device that you have your own personal device and have a look at enabling that shortcut so that you can turn on or off uh, initially a screen reader, but perhaps also magnification or indeed, as is the case with iOS, you actually have a built in video magnifier, which allows you to read hard copy. That's particularly interesting when we think about an environment where people are using more and more mobile because you can not only use magnification, which enlarges everything on screen, but on iOS, you can actually turn the device into a portable video magnifier. I'm sure that's something that we will see on Android in the near future. And in terms of ease of use, it's worth pointing out that the gestures for accessing magnification for low vision students really are much simpler on the Android platform uh, currently. So they're requiring one finger rather than three. Again, I would encourage people post seminar to post webinar to have a look at that uh, functionality and enable it on your device and become comfortable with turning it on and off and navigating around. Next slide, please. So in terms of visual adjustments, I've mentioned the built-in magnifier on iOS. Again, I would encourage you to have a look at that because many students will carry who are visually impaired might carry a, a, a video magnifier of some kind. And really now we're at a point where mobile tech is offering something that's pretty much as good built into the operating system. That's a big change. Color inversion. This is something that I use as a low vision student every single day. Um, color inversion is extremely useful, being able to flip the polarity of light on dark to dark on light. Most students who've got some kind of glare sensitivity will prefer a light on dark, but um, it's worth checking with individuals and just making sure that they're aware of that functionality. I should also mention dark theme. So dark theme is now available on iOS and Android. You won't find it in accessibility. It'll be under display and settings. And this is very interesting because it would have started off as something that was seen as an accessibility feature. And now with a more widespread understanding of accessibility, many users who wouldn't identify as having a visual impairment would actually prefer the option to change the theme. And indeed, if you're someone who likes a dark theme on a device and you're using a device with an OLED display, that will also give you better battery life. So there's a broader benefit. Color inversion, so we're able to mention, they were able to change colors uh, and, and customize them really in a way that will work for us as an individual reader. Thinking also about the fact that readers may wish to change their reading preferences depending on the time of day. Perhaps you become tired, perhaps your vision is not so good in the evening and glare becomes an issue. You can then change the color preferences to suit your particular needs. 
So EPUB apps can adjust uh, the font, the text size, the colors, and also the spacing. And it's really worth experimenting with that in terms of your own preferences. Many people will, for example, discover that maybe a sepia background is quite helpful, not just for someone with a visual impairment, but many people who have dyslexia will also tell us that that is helpful. Um, again, there may be some variation with time of day and level of tiredness. Many people will transition from reading as a partially sighted reader using large text and magnification, and others will, will use speech, but a lot of people will dip in and out of both. So it's worth thinking about this more as a continuum rather than as an either or. So read aloud, speak selection, speak screen. This is an incredibly useful feature, being able to highlight text on screen and have that spoken out. Um, select to speak as well, being able to, to create a portion of the text. So a low vision reader who selects a portion of text and has that read out. So EPUB reading apps may have read aloud features or can use the integrated features. It's also worth mentioning here that a recent update um, to the Google Assistant allows you in Android 11 to be on a web page and to say, uh, hey, G-O-O-G-L-E, uh, read this, and it will simply read out what is on screen. That's very interesting because it allows some of the functionality of a screen reader for someone whose primary method is sighted reading. And I like that as a low vision reader because it allows me to really quickly flip back and forth in an agile way between having speech and using sighted reading. Thank you. So in terms of screen readers, we had a quick dip in early on to voiceover, which is the Apple iOS and uh, Mac screen reader. It's also on uh, Apple TV OS and watch OS if anyone's interested. That's uh, quite a a robust reading experience that will allow people to essentially access content using synthetic speech. I'd encourage you to try voiceover and also talk back on the Android platform. We've also mentioned their voice assistant, which is on many Galaxy devices, and also voice view, which is the forked version of Android that exists on the Kindle uh, devices. So um, all of the, the, the Amazon devices essentially that have speech. So everything from a Kindle tablet through to another device like a, like a show, for example, Echo Show. So support for text, image descriptions, heading, navigation lists, etc. So we've got the chance to work through those lists and actually customize each of those elements according to um, our preferences as well. Um, support in tables, it has to be said is okay uh, on, on mobile. Um, but support for maths is really quite limited at this time. We haven't seen an application on mobile that delivers a really good, robust experience in that domain. Next slide, please. So considerations for uh, mobile accessibility, uh, latest is greatest options for text input. And really here, we're thinking about the fact that many people are taking advantage of the inbuilt digital assistants like the Google Assistant and Siri um, and maybe Bixby on the Samsung platform and utilizing the capability to input using uh, dictation. So I'm someone who will typically dictate somewhere between 50 and 60 emails per day using dictation. It's improving quite substantially the more that I use it. Um, perhaps five years ago, a typical page of 14 point text would have had 10 errors in it if I dictated it. Now I can often do that with maybe only one or two errors. So my job is to edit that, but it's a super fast way of using the productivity application um, to, to, to improve access for me as a low vision user. There are many options for text input. So of course you can use dictation as I've mentioned, you could type on screen, but many people will also Bluetooth a keyboard to their mobile device to enable them to have a faster and more tactile input. If you're someone who really prefers a keyboard, that's a good way to go about it. And they're very low cost uh, and straightforward. So among the accessories, of course, there would be Bluetooth keyboards. I'm right now using something called a tablet stand, which in my case is made by Belkin. There are other manufacturers, but I find that particularly helpful because it allows me to use the tablet device that I'm presenting from and managing the Zoom call from 
I can adjust that to any angle that I want. I can also fold it up flat and bung it in a backpack and take it with me wherever I may find myself. So one of the ergonomic advantages of a desktop or laptop setup can actually be partially replicated through using a stand such as the one I've mentioned. Also in terms of displays, there's some research that says that curved displays minimize eye strain. That did come from an ophthalmologist in South Korea. That's very interesting. Many people tell us that a curved display actually minimizes eye strain and improves um, the kind of engagement. So we need to see more research on that, but an interesting one to think about. Maybe a USB hub in terms of connecting a USB stick to uh, a mobile device such as an iPad. So often that may be something that has been given to you on a pen drive that can be then be plugged into that hub. And of course, we wouldn't um, be doing justice to it if we didn't mention Braille. Braille has been reborn in the digital age and we're seeing a really rapid growth here in the UK of people accessing digital Braille. So pairing a Bluetooth Braille display with their mobile device. And that gives the opportunity to have another dimension of access. If you're a Brailleist, and Braille, is a, as you will perhaps know, is a wonderful medium for literacy, and it will enable people to read what's on the display through a row of uh, moving metal pins on a very small device that's not much bigger than a couple of large smartphones on top of one another. That will give you a physical size for the latest Braille displays. And it has to also be noted that the cost has reduced massively within the last couple of years, around about 10% of the cost that it was five years ago. So where is this all going? So investment is clearly heading into mobile. If you talk to any commercial company that's building digital services, a larger skew of that investment is going into mobile. Devices and services are getting smarter, thinking about the assistants that are baked in, Google Assistant, if anyone has used the latest iteration of the Google Assistant, you'll recognize the progress within that particular digital assistant. But voice control and intelligent assistants are playing a role in everyone's lives when it comes to utilizing technology. So for people who are blind or low vision, they have got a massive value. I think one of the things we can all do is reach out to the students that we're working with, the learners that we're engaged with, and make sure that people are aware of the progress that's taken place in the last couple of years. It's possible to control pretty much every element of iOS 14 using voice control. So actually asking the device to perform the things that you want to do. We also need to be mindful of the merging of desktop and mobile. And of course, the birth of new form factors such as uh, devices with two screens, foldables, new generation, next generation flip phones that have two screens and a huge range of devices that are coming on stream that are really beginning to disrupt and challenge the status quo. All of this offers us an opportunity and it will be fascinating to see where this takes mobile learning in the near future. I think it's a super exciting time to be in this space. Thank you, Robin, and thank you to Darren and Stacey and Erin for flying us through that amazing uh, overview of, you know, reviewing whether uh, reading and learning is going mobile. What then are the views of our attendees of the webinar and what do people think at the beginning of this? Well, let's see the poll results. Uh, so for the statement, learners need a laptop to be a serious student, 9% of respondents strongly disagree with that. 33% of them dis disagree, 24% neither agree nor disagree, 31% agree and 4% strongly agree that learners do need a laptop to be a serious student. Well, for me, this leads us into um, the first question I have queued up really, which is, of course, we've really uh, framed the, the presentation and what we've asked people to speak to really around accessible reading, but to be a serious student, you also need to complete work. Um, so my question really to, to you, Darren, first of all is for all that, very large number of students who are using mobile devices as their primary study method, are they using this to consume content or are they also completing assignments by using these uh, mobile devices? Well, that, well, good question. And that's going to be part two of our survey as we dig in. But they're such, um, they're so adept at texting 
that a lot of them actually do. Uh, it's going to be interesting to get the final numbers there. Um, but just as I think Stacy or Aaron was saying about the digital natives, they're so used to texting that to them, it doesn't seem like that large of a leap for them to respond to, say, a discussion board uh, on their mobile phone. Very interesting. Robin and I were talking before this session about how these Bluetooth keyboards were definitely a thing about five years or so ago, but actually we were saying we'd seen less of those in the last few years. Robin, you know, you talked about having a USB or a Bluetooth keyboard connected to a mobile device. Thinking back to when you were a student or maybe to the work you're doing now, would you really be reaching for a keyboard or would you be using the on-screen um, keyboard and the voice dictation? What do you really need to be a serious student? Do you need a keyboard? I think for many people, it's a, it's a very individual choice. So if you've been raised on a tactile keyboard and that's something that's your default, it might be difficult. But I think as, you know, as was pointed out a moment ago, I think if you've grown up with a mobile phone, probably your response to that is different. You're, you're probably a default swipe typer, swipe texter who uses swipe typing, which is incredibly efficient when you put the effort in. Um, it's all about options really. And I think if people have got the option to use a Bluetooth keyboard, that may work well for some people. Maybe you want to touch type a long piece of text that's going to be an efficient mechanism for, for some. For me, I have to say, I would use a mix of uh, on-screen typing and dictation, probably dictation as the default. Um, and, and I think if you are prepared to put the effort in and you're happy to, to speak in a clear way, then you can get good results from it. It won't work for everybody. The key, I guess, is that choice is king here. You know, Make sure that students have got the option to try out a Bluetooth keyboard, try out swipe texting, which they've probably been doing already, but also encourage them to try out dictation. It might be a different experience from one that they've tried previously. And I guess for a student who's using a screen reader on a mobile device, actually maybe there a keyboard might sometimes be kind of handy for just navigating around content in some ways, but it's not a break or break uh, decision because I guess these things aren't so pricey and not so hard to learn. Absolutely. Many students will tell us if they're using an iPad, for example, they like the idea of having a case that also has a keyboard in it, because um, that, that's, that's kind of more akin to the size of keyboard that they may have been accustomed to and may have learned on. Um, but it's really about what works for the individual learner. And I, I think to try out different strategies, that's a really good thing that we can all encourage people to do. Try out dictation, try out a Bluetooth keyboard. Sometimes you don't know until you try what's going to work best for you. And maybe that varies across the subjects that you're studying and maybe even across the type of um, assignments that you're responding to. And now, Stacy talked about the support for students um, from DSOs in engaging um, with, uh, with mobile technologies. Uh, certainly, uh, colleges and voluntary organizations would run training courses for people on how to use computers but I've not yet seen training courses on how to use mobile devices. Maybe people kind of assume that folk just know how to use them and what the accessibility features are. Uh, Darren and Robin, would you comment on the support that come from your organizations that would help uh, folk using reading services, whether that's a library or uh, from a college to actually get to grips and get the best out of the mobile devices? Or do you feel that's not necessary? Uh, absolutely, and I'm glad that questions come up Richard because I think this is a real challenge of our time there's a huge amount assumed in terms of mobile devices and you really see that when you give a mobile device to a young child because you can see that they've grown up for example with touch screens and there's an awful lot of behaviors that are just default they're natural for children to try out whereas if you've grown up for example in a desktop type environment there is quite a lot to learn so you know, more functionality being added to the OS, more gestures being added, um, richer applications that have got more functionality. All of those things really demand, you know, a refreshing and an updating of skills. So I guess if you imagine if you'd used a mobile, you know, 10 years ago, for example, and you fast forward to now, you'd probably be able to do lots of things. But there are, there are new things that have come about and have become a default that you might need a bit of a refresher on. So you know, in the UK, RNIB, we have a tech for life team 
And a lot of their work is around exactly that. It's making sure that people can keep up pace on the developments in technology. It's constantly shifting. And I think unless you're, you know, unless you're one of those people that looks at the contents of a new software update, you might just miss something. So Darren, it got kind of thrown in your direction. DSOs need to get up to speed with the accessibility features of mobile and supporting students. What's your response to that? Are you up to it? Uh, well, we're, we're trying. Uh, we have a lot to learn and, and we're going to have to start doing a lot more trainings on just, you know, mobile functionality, uh, really. We assume people know things that they don't or, well, let me put it another way. We're not always they're not always as efficient as they should be on their mobile devices. So that's some training that, that we're gonna have to do. And I'm gonna be emailing Robin and bugging him quite a bit or maybe some, <laughs> some tips or some coaching. You're welcome to. That's, that's one in which we're lacking a little. I'm coming to you in a moment, Stacy. but just first, we have a quick question in from Nafisa. I'd appreciate a short response. Uh, could you just explain what you mean by swipe te texting, please, Robin? Of course, that's a great question. Thank you, Nafisa. So swipe texting will be uh, more appropriate for people who have low vision than it is for people who are using a screen reader. So this is essentially enabling so that the keyboards on both operating systems now enable you to type a word by essentially moving your finger from the first letter to the next letter and subsequent letters without leaving the screen. So essentially drawing a pattern across the screen, which then creates the word that pops up on screen. Um, it's a, you know, certainly as someone with low vision, it's something that I use, but it's not going to be uh, something that someone who's a screen reader is going to necessarily use. So yeah, that's a particularly, uh, I guess, low vision specific element. It's really about improving uh, the speed of typing in a, in a kind of modern way, I guess. And it's about making sure that the system learns the words that you would typically input and also suggests them on screen. Thank you for that. So I'm coming to you first, Stacey, and then to you, um, Erin. We have a couple of questions in from Deborah. Uh, Deborah was clever enough to put these questions in uh, before the start of the webinar. So um, you make sure that these get asked. So do your apps uh, have any built-in magnification or text-to-speech, or is it assumed that the user will work with the accessibility features of the mobile operating system? Um, and then the second question is, what about a student who wants to make audio annotations? So Stacey, first on that one, apps with um, built-in magnification or text-to-speech. Yes, so our apps do have both um, text-to-speech. So we use the operating system to audibly read the content of the EPUB. And we also have uh, text magnification. And so that's those visual displays that I had talked about where we, um, actually enable the user to select font, select font size, and increase that font. And of course, because it's an EPUB, it automatically reflows according to the screen size. It makes for, I think, a really optimal uh, user experience. Great. And Erin, uh, how about you with your uh, new app that's escaped and is being discovered by these digital <laughs> natives? Uh, how way. are you? Uh, yeah, yeah, the same. We, we offer text-to-speech um, within the app, uh, as well as the ability just to simply zoom into the content, which is probably used a little bit more in the PDF con content, um, considering you know, EPUB is more applicable to those display options that um, Stacy was talking about, but we also still offer those display options, changing the background, foreground, fonts, and uh, sizes with EPUBs as well. Um, and what about to Deborah's question uh, about audio notes? So recognizing that learning isn't a passive experience of just reading content, you want to make notes and maybe write content too. Um, uh, ha let's hear first from Stacey and Erin whether you have that feature and then uh, maybe to Robin as to how you make uh, notes as you go through your day. So Stacey? Yeah, so um, on Bookshelf, we actually don't incorporate at this point um, audio, the ability to make audio notes. I know that recently TalkBack Android uh, released a new update, new version of their um, operating system accessibility features that enable more of a, a voice 
uh, talk back, you know, audible type experience. Um, it's something that, that we've considered, but we've not um, added it on our roadmap at this time. And Erin? I think it's a great idea, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, like Stacy mentioned, a, a little bit easier in some operating systems than others. Um, I also think that in terms of the app, that's probably more of uh, applicable to a native app. Um, so that's definitely something I can uh, add to our list as we move, you know, towards that um, native app experience. So Robin, you're, you're living your life, you're doing your day of, uh, of work and study and you're reading content and you want to make some uh, notes. How, what's a good way to do that? Thinking of your own experience and also other folk that you work with and, uh, uh, and support. Well, in my case, I'm constantly experimenting. So right now in Android 11, there's a great new recorder app, which is part of the operating system. So if you have an Android 11 device, just go into settings or go into search and find recorder. Now, what this will do is it will record your messages as an audio message, but it will also give you a transcript. That's really useful. You can then cut and paste it and, and share it, etc. So I'm using that. I'm also using the notes feature in iOS. That's only because I'm a creature of habit. I've always got an iPhone with me and I've always got a Pixel and I want to try and keep on top of both. Sometimes I'm also using the, um, the Teams application, um, but it's a great question. I think one of the things that we've kind of not quite seen yet is the perfect note-taking application. That's our, those are a couple of examples I'm using. We hear people who are using quite a, quite a wide variety of note takers, really. The built-in uh, note-taking application on iOS or Keep in Google, one of the advantages of that really is that you can, you know, you can get as much flexibility as possible by using the native application. Very easy to share, cut and paste, etc. I guess the solution is the one which works best for you. And we would encourage all of you to encourage learners that you're working with to just try out these applications um, and find out what works best for you. That's wonderful. Um, we've heard a little bit from Stacey and Erin uh, about the ability to change the size of the font and to, to zoom in. We've got a specific question here from Victoria, which is, what about the challenge of viewing large images that are in an ebook on a small screen? Uh, so I guess we could hear from many of our panelists on this, um, the ability to, to zoom in. Does this work? Is this actually a limitation that is just the physical constraints of a, of a small display? Images in ebooks, zooming in, is can, that a thing? Can I can I jump in here? I think that this may be simpler for people who low vision people who are using Android. And the reason that I say that is that one of the skills that I think you need to develop if you become a low vision reader who's looking at images, and I've done this very, very recently, in fact, just earlier on today, is that when you're using the inbuilt magnification feature on Android. Crucially, one of the differences it allows you is the ability to use a pinch to zoom gesture inside the magnifier. So you've magnified the image by triple tapping with one finger. But if you then want to just eke in a little bit further to see a tiny bit more, you can do that uh, using a very fine pinch to zoom movement that everybody's familiar with, and you can achieve the desired level of magnification. It is a challenge. I think it's something that people will come up with their own strategy for. But I would suggest looking at that as an option. I'd also say that sometimes it's just easier to mirror your device. Maybe you plug in a cable that connects it to a monitor or maybe even a television. Or if you're lucky enough, maybe you even, you know, stream it to an Apple TV if you're lucky, lucky enough to have something like that and get that image up on a big screen. Sometimes there's a super easy way um, and sometimes there's a, a kind of, tricky way to do it. But I think pinch to zoom inside magnification on Android is a really way of getting a fine adjustment. So um, this is a broad topic, of course, and we're talking about accessible mobile reading, which isn't only something that happens in higher education and college. Um, but let's so let's have a think about of all the sorts of things that we've discussed um, today, uh, the world going mobile um, and learning happening not only at college, but also at school. I'll ask our panelists to think about 
what about learners in school, in, in the school system itself? And what about leisure reading? Do you see many of the things that we've talked about being relevant um, there? Darren, what are your thoughts on that? Do you see students using these kinds of technologies in a school setting as well? Yeah, well, very interestingly, we in the state of North Carolina, we started reaching out to our K-12 colleagues just to sort of bridge our accessibility work at the community college system with some of them. And what we're finding is the younger students, these, I guess, super digital natives are, are really gravitating towards mobile and, and using these technologies in ways we don't necessarily think of. So as I was saying earlier, we have a lot to learn about mobile training, uh, implementation, uh, how we're gonna really sort of revalue or, or reassess our work here. So yeah, we, we've noticed a, a sort of a, a through line, I guess. Well, Darren, I think that's, that's very interesting. Just as we're coming to the uh, end of this session, then you introduced that new piece, which is that, yeah, uh, learning is already mobile as we heard from Stacy and we heard from Erin around how how the um, the events of last year has accelerated that progression so the things that we who are already adults uh, our behavior is changing and then as you say Darren there are folk now who are coming through whose devices that they clutch in their hands all day long are those mobile devices and their expectations and needs will be maybe different to even the students who are in college um, right now. So we're coming to the end of this session. Uh, once again, thank you to Darren, Stacy, Erin and Robin for sharing great information and for a wonderful discussion. Um, our session next will be a webinar on April the 7th and is titled Word Document Accessibility Part 2. So returning by popular demand and building on our first Word document accessibility session, this webinar will begin our journey beyond the basics. Through practical examples, our invited experts will share how to create accessible content using a range of Microsoft Word features and walking through the implications for accessibility in different scenarios, guiding us through how to resolve many of the common issues. You can register at daisy.org forward slash webinars, where you can also sign up to the announcements mailing list and review previous webinar recordings and resources. I hope you'll join us again soon. In the meantime, thank you for your time. Stay safe and well, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>